to introduce you to our guest speakers. Cool, well, thanks Siobhan. Okay, I'm Ross McCulloch from Third Sector Lab. So today's topic for Trustees Week is digital trustees and the need for strategic leadership. So obviously, as you know, over COVID, lots of people have veered rapidly towards using digital services and probably what we've seen a lack of is maybe understanding at a board level and a strategic direction of travel in particular as people are taking stock of what they do and what they don't do. Um, I had a really interesting chat the other day, which kind of was timely with this, where I was speaking to a charity chief exec and they were like, why should a board know anything about digital? Because that's operational, it's nothing to do with strategy. It's like, right, I wonder how many other charity chief execs think exactly the same thing that you just told me. So for me, that's, that's a really obvious thing that we need to be thinking about is how do we move digital from being seen as purely operational towards actually what is the strategic oversight of digital and why is it even important in the first place? So we've got two speakers, so John you'll be familiar with. So John Fitzgerald, who's SCEO's Digital Evolution Manager and is also a trustee with Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust. And Chris Yu, who is Executive Director of Technology and Public Policy Institute for Global Change and is also a trustee with Enable Scotland. I don't know if you're a trustee with anyone else, Chris, but it's just Enable. Yeah. Cool. So I'm gonna, we're gonna hand over to John first of all. We'll do the usual format where you can ask questions as you go in the chat box. But also, once you've heard from speakers, you can unmute and just jump on and ask questions directly if you prefer. So I'll hand over to you just now, John. You got your slides. Yes, thank you. I'm aware that I'm technically breaking the rules by having slides, but I think I'm allowed to. Um, so I'll speak briefly, not for a long time, but just to kind of introduce my own experience and my own reflections on being a digital trustee. And then I think I'll probably go just straight on to Chris and then we can just open up to questions after that. That's okay. Um, so um, what I decided to do to kind of organize my thinking a wee bit was think about then and now, because I was actually a trustee of a small organization about 12 years ago and ended up doing digital stuff by accident. And that made me think about how things have changed in the last 12 years, both personally as a trustee, but also in the wider digital context. So just to get us going, obviously 12 years ago, um, probably not many of us actually touched an iPhone. They were still quite a new thing. Um, and so digital was still at a much earlier stage. Um, the organization I was a trustee of then was really small, so I had very low capacity and they were looking to, a web, to do a website project. And I think the main problem that I had, because I was quite a young and very new trustee, was I didn't give enough strategic challenge at the beginning of this project. And what that meant was that the web project didn't really have enough resource to do it well. And there wasn't a great focus on user needs or business goals. And as a result of that, I got a bit sucked into techie problems. So rather than being a kind of nice strategic trustee and um, setting good parameters, um, I was getting sucked into um, techie problems. Um, so now skipping ahead to 2020, uh, where we are today, well, it's obvious that we're in a very digital context. Probably a lot of us are working remote first at the moment. If you're a trustee, the context is much more volatile. We can't really make assumptions about what the next six months will be like. On the other hand, as a positive, there's an off the shelf tech solution for almost everything. So particularly for smaller organizations, if you're trying to do basic digital things. There's very easy to use platforms out there. And that means you could be much more focused on user needs. So I think there's a lot more to make use of now. I think for smaller organizations, it's a less challenging journey to get digital, but I still think there's a big role for trustees to keep, help keep the ambition in the right place. Just now I want to talk a little bit about um, the actual direct experience of being a trustee. So the organization is part of 12 years ago was international so there's loads and loads of travel connected with being a trustee so when I was 28 that felt like quite a fun thing to do but it took huge amounts of time so now of course as trustees and um, if we're able to use zoom and things like that that's actually very beneficial because it can fit into trustee lifestyle much more you can meet on a more frequent basis without the travel that you might have if you're meeting physically the trust I'm part of now, Joseph Ryan Free Charitable Trust, has been using digital agendas for a long time. And that's really good, although I still think there's areas where we could make much more use of that and prepare trustees more effectively for meetings, because that really helps them do a good job. 
So having compared those two experiences, I'm just going to use a matrix now. This is me nearly wrapped up, by the way, in case you're wondering if there's 50 more slides to come. Um, and what I want to do is think about two, well, four situations, really. Um, first of all, what it would be like to be in a very small organisation if you as a trustee had low digital expertise. And my suggestions are the two things you should be focused on there. Down the bottom here are agreeing priorities and doing the basics well. I think you shouldn't try and be massively ambitious, but just try and get a clear focus on what you want to do and do things to a good standard. If you're a trustee with comparatively high expertise in a small organisation, again, I think you still be agreeing priorities. You should stay realistic about what the organisation can achieve, but I think you should probably help them get a strategy to move along and develop. And you might want to do some mentoring and helping the staff team find some useful networks, but I would be quite careful about becoming a techie volunteer by accident, because that's not really a good thing for a trustee to be doing. They should be focused on governance and the big picture. So turning now to a bigger organisation where there's more capacity, this could be you've got more skills in your staff, staff team, or you've got more budget to work with external partners. I think if you're a low expertise trustee in this situation, I would be quite humble and be listening and learning. Don't get in the way of your staff, let them get on with it. As a board, your discussion should probably be quite big picture. And having said that, trustees, I think should understand the, the risks and the positive impacts of digital. So I think even if your organization is in a good place digitally and your trustees are a bit naive about digital, they should still know what's going on. And I think one argument I give if I was talking to your chief executive is if you keep your trustees in the picture, that can help you unlock investment to do more digital stuff. And also it means your board members can be good advocates and talk about the good things that you're doing as an organization. If you're in the very lucky position of being an organization with good capacity and high expertise in your board, um, then I think you can focus on slightly different questions. So you can be asking things like, are we using resources efficiently? You could maybe be having a quite future focused discussion. So saying, right, we're in a good place now, we've solved all the immediate problems, but where would we like to get to in about five years time? And particularly as a trustee, you could be challenging your staff team if they're very competent and have a lot of insight to push them a bit harder to go a bit further. And you might also be in a position where you could share insights and resources with the wider sector. So if you're in an organization that's going well, maybe you could share either technical solutions that you've put together or insight and learning that you've developed. So if another organization working on the same issue is coming along six months or 12 months behind you, if you help them, that will have impact for the whole sector because they're trying to say, solve the same problems that you are. So that's something you could think about if you were a trustee of a very capable organization. So I'm going to wrap up in a second just by highlighting a few key questions, I think, because I think my experience has been as a trustee, if you ask the right questions, then you really add value to the organization. So I think you should stay open minded as a trustee. So it's really important to leave your hobby horse in the paddock. So particularly if you've got favorite bits of tech or favorite approaches, be really cautious about pushing them to your staff team because as a trustee, your, your voice is quite influential. So particularly in bigger organizations, if a trustee um, pushes on an issue that can create loads of work for the staff team. So try not to get in the way. And related to that, I think I'd be talking to staff about how you can add value. So get a sense of how much input would be helpful for them. What you don't want to do is get bogged down in the detail, but you do want to be a really useful sounding board at key points in the process. I would stay focused on the big picture. So really big questions like, how much are we investing in this? How long is it gonna take? What strategic problem is it gonna solve for us? But also think critically, you know, if you see something being developed or something that's coming up on board papers and you think this isn't very well thought through, do you challenge it as a trustee? That's your job is to, to provide that governance and input. Because if you don't do it at the beginning, you can't really turn around three years later and say, well, I was going to ask that, but I, I decided not to in the end. So 
that's a kind of quick whiz through from me. So thank you very much. And sorry again for the slides, but I hope they were helpful in highlighting what I was talking about. So I'm going to pass across to Chris now. Um, and obviously there'll be a good bit of time for Q&A as well from both of our talks. Fantastic. John, thank you so much. Um, uh, and I, I wholeheartedly endorse everything that you just said. So let me um, build on a little bit of that with a few reflections from um, uh, my experience um, at Enable Scotland, where I've been a trustee for the last few years. Um, and I think, you know, we have been on um, quite an interesting journey in terms of um, digital transformation. Um, for a bit of context, um, Enable Scotland has about 2,000 uh, people in its workforce. And over the last few years, um, you know, we've had quite aggressive um, and important um, modernization program in place, which has involved things like um, uh, making sure that we swapped out all of our hardware for modern, uh, sensible, centrally managed systems so that everything was known and can be easily updated. Um, and also, you know, save plenty of money retendering for some of those uh, devices and contracts. Um, managed to um, digitally enable our frontline workforce and take a lot of the paper out of the processes. So rotors and timesheets are electronic now rather than uh, on uh, physical um, bits and pieces. Um, and I think, you know, the combination of um, seeing that change in the plumbing through has really helped us to focus on the bit of the activity that really matters, which is the service you provide to uh, to your to your users. So, um, you know, this has been interesting and ambitious to do. Um, a few reflections, thinking about it from a trustee perspective. Um, the first is, I think, and you mentioned this, John, it's quite easy for people to interpret um, your digital background or your um, you know digital expertise as solely relating to ICT. And you can very quickly get boxed into conversations about you know, the hardware and the software and the contracts and the specifications. Um, you know, I've been pretty clear from the outset that um, you know, the organization has to contend with those sorts of issues and the board can't ignore them. And, and it can't just push them down to someone on the exec team and say, that's an operational question. Um, but you've also, I think, got a responsibility to help people understand that, you know, a charity's digital journey is not the same thing as its IT journey. Those two are quite closely related because you haven't got good foundations and you can't do all the other things that you want to do with technology. Um, but, you know, fixing the plumbing is not the end goal, right? Fixing the plumbing is a step along the way to changing the way that you operate and the way that you do business and the impact that you make in the world. Um, so, you know, that's been important for us. And I think you sometimes have to be patient, right? Because if you want to do the excellent digital work and the, you know, service design and everything else, you do sometimes need to take the time to fix the basics. Um, so, you know, bearing with people on that is important. Um, I think secondly, and some of us have talked about this at events previously, um, it's quite important as one of the people on the board with more experience in this arena um, that you try to, um, you know, you've got to, in my view, be prepared to give quite generously of that expertise where you can um, and, you know, resist the thing that happens sometimes, which is for, you know, whichever person to have the digital hat and everybody else thinks that they don't need to worry about it. Um, and back when I worked at SCVO, we were saying the same thing then, which is, um, you know, this is an issue that belongs to the chief exec and the entire board and, and not just uh, to one or two people um, and, you know, forcing that, you know, bringing people into the conversation and not letting um, it just be kind of parked on your desk because you're the digital person the same way that, um, you know, if you're in finance, you often end up on the finance committee or whatever else, right? Like actually it's got to be something which is um, shared in terms of the, uh, in terms of the ownership. Um, and then I think the last thing I'd say is, um, you know, you can play an important role, I think, in, um, you know, it's both the, the challenge and the critical thinking that John mentioned, and also helping people envision some different futures. Um, and of course, you've got to be careful not to, uh, you know, box people into your particular view, or kind of tell people that this is the only answer, and there's no other way to do it, because, um, you know, you bring some outside expertise, but not necessarily 
um, like depending on the organization, um, you may or may not be in the detail of the day-to-day -day operations. Um, but I think it can be enormously helpful to give people that big picture, that external perspective, that sense of actually um, what is working well in the other places that you're aware of, the different um, arenas that you move in, um, and you know that creativity um, with other parts of the board and with the organization can be really helpful. So I spend some of my time um, you know, in board meetings and with the exec team, and I spend some of my time you know, when, um, when it's helpful and beneficial um, with members of the staff team if they're working on particular projects and they need an extra pair of eyes or someone to bounce ideas off, um, I try to make myself available. Um, and um, you know, in, my, um, in my case, there hasn't been a tremendous um, ask in my time, actually. I mean, the organization has been quite deliberate about um, you know, when to come to me and other members of the board for um, advice and extra problem solving. Um, but I think if you manage that relationship well, then it can be time really well spent. So look, why don't I pause there, Ross, and we can have some questions and discussion. Mm, yeah, that sounds good. Um, Siobhan, any questions that have come in from chat that stood out for you? Um, yeah, so there's a question, uh, but John's answered it, but maybe it could open up like a bigger discussion because I think it'd be quite relevant to a lot of people. So Alan was asking uh, what John meant that some organizations are using digital agendas. So John, do you want to just expand a bit more on that, how you've managed that process of moving things to yeah, digital? Sure, so actually, I should say at the outset that kind of preceded me. So um, it was there before, but I think the interesting aspect of it right now is we have these quite chunky board papers and actually in Joseph Rowntree in the main building, there's still the big mail room where they used to print these humongous paper agendas and mail them out to trustees. As some old trustees used to talk about when they had their trust fax machine that they would fax each other comments on applications and stuff. So <laughs> it's a bit bonkers. Anyway, that's now digital. But I think what's interesting about it is it's still in a slightly early phase. So the agenda is, you know, lots of applications in there. So you've got to read through them cover to cover. Um, I think we could do a lot more in terms of um, functionality. Like we could, some of the stuff we have there could be a dashboard in there that's, you know, automatically updated as trustees were asking for data points on numbers of applications per program and refusal rates and this kind of thing. And staff are sort of copying and pasting. So I'm on a bit of a campaign to try and make that happen a bit more smoothly. And the other one, I think, which uh, John Beaton pointed to in questions was about a kind of a secure digital office. So we're in a state where we've got SharePoint and that's set up on trustees' iPads, but trustees are not logging into SharePoint all the time. So that, you know, I think one of the challenges is if a trustee is volunteering for you and they're struggling to engage with a particular system as a staff member, what you're probably gonna end up doing is say, well, I'll just email them a PDF because I just, what I need is this trustee to see this and act on it. So that's a bit of a, a challenge. I think, you know, what I'd hope we'd, get to in a few years time is um, that it's all happening in SharePoint and we're using the features there because I think it will save staff time. And the other thing is on um, from an information security point of view, if you're discussing something very confidential, do you really want to email it to 20 personal email addresses? Possibly not. Um, and the other thing on the governance piece is sometimes if something goes wrong a regulator might say well what had the trustees seen and what papers are there so if that's all in a system and um, that could be more helpful but it is that i think one of the challenges thinking back to what a staff team might face is if your board are a bit slow to adopt stuff you know you'll tend to want to just get information to them by whatever route they make use of rather than move them to something that they're less familiar with Probably, I mean, it probably ties into a point that I was going to kind of ask both John and Chris was about, do you think there's a danger, and particularly during COVID, we've kind of just taken the way that boards have always worked and now we've stuck them on a Zoom call and we're missing a big opportunity to think about how we work in much more efficient ways. I don't know if either of you've got other, not even just efficient, but effective ways. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think... Um... I mean, from my perspective, actually, like the Zoom call has been an upgrade on um, <laughs> what we did previously in the sense that um, before this was normal, um, 
uh, we would either uh, meet in person in uh, the office in Glasgow, um, or people who couldn't be there would try and dial in by a regular old fashioned telephone. And it was a total nightmare to participate by phone. Um, and so the kind of equalizing factor of everybody being on Zoom has been in some ways quite good. Um, but I think, Ross, it's an interesting point around whether there are more creative things that could be done. I mean, I think, frankly, my sense is a lot of people are just trying to like get through at the moment. Um, but maybe out the other side of this, there are opportunities to do different sorts of things, right? Your ability to, um, you know, get um, an interesting outside perspective or, um, you know, speaker into a board meeting um, to collaborate on material um, in advance or in different ways, I think is massively increased. And like to John's point around, you know, whether we can do better than emailing PDFs to each other. Um, I think it's a good aspiration. And I guess for the people on the call who are running organizations and thinking about this, like one of the challenges is gonna be, um, you know, your trustees have got limited bandwidth and probably already like having to log into 500 other things every single day for their job and whatever their other commitments are. So exactly that point, like adding another thing for people to check can be quite a tall order. So if you can find somewhere where they already are, um, and my sense is thinking about my life, a lot more stuff seems to be appearing on Microsoft Teams than it used to be. Um, either you know where people are or things that are familiar, it's probably better than baking your own random thing that no one knows how to use. Yeah. Yeah, do you know, I've, I don't know if you've come across it, but I've come across there's like some tech company that's invented some like hideously bad board specific portal. And it's basically like a really crap version of Google Docs where you put a couple of files up and it's only for your board and then they charge charities like £6,000 a year for it. And like, it's just files on a really crap app. It's, it's, it's astonishing, like the amount of people that seem to have signed up for these kind of platforms. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting more on the kind of traveling thing because um, Joseph Randry is based in York. A lot of our meetings are in London, some are in Belfast. So for me, as a kind of Scottish based trustee, the travel was pretty crazy. So, and at, at times we, were, we, had, we had one scenario a few years back where weather grounded everybody's flights so we couldn't make a meeting in Belfast. So we did Zoom very quickly and people were surprised by how well it worked. Um, and I think what this year has taught us is if we do it right, it will, you know, do the job very well. And I think probably a barrier for boards is if you've got a very experienced chair who knows how to run a meeting well in a boardroom, they'll feel a bit nervous about doing it online because they'll maybe think, well, everybody's going to battle with a tech and it's going to take longer and so on. And so what I would advocate boards to do in that situation is have a staff member or one person who's the tech steward, if you like, who's the kind of holding the reins of all the where's the meeting link or whatever it might be. So your chair can just focus on steering the discussion. Um, but I think our experience has been, you know, it's, it's doing a great job. I think the point Chris made about um, needing to adjust approach you know what we've seen is you know we probably need shorter meetings um because it's more tiring so you know you can manage a three-hour in-person board meeting fine but if you you're doing that on zoom by about hour two you're kind of struggling um and i think the other thing though i think in relation to that is if you travel to a board meeting you change context so you kind of you don't quite get your board shirt on perhaps but um you kind of get your head into a, a boardroom setting and that can be helpful. You know, I used to read papers on the train to London because it was time that I could just concentrate on that. So I think if you're setting up a board meeting where everybody's maybe just been doing their day job until 20 minutes ago, you might need to give a bit of time at the start to kind of get people back into that headspace. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to ask a quick question for people in the room. So you can either do this. If you're on video, stick your hand up. If you're not on video, use the thumbs up emoji and the reactions down the bottom with a smiley face. Can I ask out of the people in the room, who has a digital trustee? So who's got someone on your board who's a digital expert in some format and is leading this type of change? So can I get a show of hands or a thumbs up with the emoji? 
lot of people have some people have gone for a hybrid or a thumbs up on the video. That's also okay. You can do that as well. Right. So there's probably a nice bag in the room. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. So still, I mean, I think one one of the big things that I constantly get asked is, well, you use the word digital trustee, what do you actually mean by that? And what, what are we actually trying to recruit here? And there is no easy answer to that question, I guess. Be interesting for the people in the room, John and Chris, do you have any thoughts in terms of that starting point of that thinking? If you're either working with your board or you're a board member, where, where do you need to start that thinking in terms of that person you're going to recruit and who is that type of person you want to get on the board? It's an interesting one. I mean, I think the analogy I often find myself reaching for is you've got a financial director of an organisation and a finance team, but you've got a treasurer as well. And obviously that's because where the money goes or doesn't go is pretty mission critical to an organisation. It's a really big piece of legal accountability. Um, and I feel like, you know, digital is getting as important as that now as well. You know, if you do digital really badly, that could have existential implications for your organisation. And a kind of just about OK digital trustee might just help you make sure you're kind of on track and, and doing all right. But if you had a really good digital trustee, they could really move your organisation ahead by offering, I think, as Chris said, thinking about a different future, you know, a different way that you could do things. And I think there's something quite important by having that provocation at a board level. So not just quite pushy, ambitious staff desperately trying to get trustees to give them permission, but actually something at a board level where somebody's saying, we don't need to keep doing it the same way, we can do it in quite a radically different way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Ross, there's something in here about um, like how you define the term digital, and I'm sure plenty of us could spend like a long time in a pub one evening doing that. But um, for me, the point is, um, that it's, it's quite easy for it to be seen through the technology lens. And the way that I view it is actually, you've got to separate two things, right? So there's all of your IT stack, which in my mind sits somewhere quite close to facilities and photocopiers and all that stuff. And then there's your digital transformation, which is much closer to your modernization, reform, forward strategy, what's your operating model, all these sorts of questions. Um, and so I think, you know, for charities thinking about this sort of thing, I mean, you almost certainly need both of those. You might not find both of those sorts of skills in the one person. Um, and it wouldn't be fair on the organization or the trustee to say, just because somebody is a Microsoft certified professional, they understand how to do, you know, user um, centered, design for a digital alternative to a traditional transaction. Or just because somebody is like ace at social media, therefore they're gonna come in and sort out your Office 365. Um, so getting really clear on um, your needs as an organization, both like now and your long-term transformation goals, if you have them, I think is important because that will help you to um, distinguish a bit better what you're looking for and therefore what sorts of conversations to have. Yeah, yeah, that's very good advice. Yeah, I think it's why, I mean, like, so through the work with Digital Trustee Scotland, trying to get people to keep a really open mind about what a digital trustee is, and actually some really successful charities that have moved forward really quickly. It's been a service designer, it's been a data analyst, it's a, uh, uh, yeah, data, more to, data analyst who's ended up on the board and actually been really open-minded about the type of person that you're trying to recruit. Uh, Sally SCBO always talks about, if you're unsure and you're at like an early stage, trying to recruit a digital all-rounder. So if you've got someone who comes from a background, maybe working in the charity sector, maybe a small business, and who's had to do a lot of those roles, that can be beneficial as well. And there's a really good, uh, Siobhan's put in the chat there, Reach Volunteering, I've got a kind of a couple of model job descriptions as starting points. But I think as Chris said, it's like that, that ability to define what is digital to you and what's important to you at the moment is a really, really good starting point. Um, and I guess just echoing what he said is like, it's really easy to read into the kind of IT tech support or the social media comms camp and just think, well, that's just dealt with digital because we tick one of those boxes and just thinking about it in a much, much broader sense. Okay. 
I'm sticking in this description of what a digital trustee does. So Ross, when you asked that question of who has a digital trustee, Maeve has actually said that she's literally just started as a digital trustee. So cool. she's happy to talk a little bit about what she's seen so far. Do you want to unmute yourself, Maeve? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting session so far. Um, yeah, as Siobhan said, I've, I've just volunteered with the Berlini Prisons Visitor Centre. They call themselves the Croft. Um, they had some really good incumbents there who did some great work um, to establish a, a more formal kind of web presence, but there's a lot of opportunity there. So I thought, wow, okay, I can see how I can help add some value here. And I think, you know, um, especially with this pandemic, um, it's even more important than ever to really think about what that end user experience is like and uh, in the community as well. So how do they communicate their value? Um, so I'm interested in all that. Um, I'm still getting to know the charity. I'm getting to know the people. They're fantastic. I've had one board meeting. Uh, the first board meeting, they just like they, they've got um, a new administrator and she just got them all onto teams like she did a great job. I didn't even have to do, uh, initiate that chat. I said, hmm, are you on any kind of video conversation? No, all taken care of. She set up the team, but it still took us all about like 10 or 15 minutes to all join together, which is just symptomatic of where we're at. I think someone in the chat said we're at that stage now where people are not quite au fait with it, but we're getting there. Um, and I agree with John that I think maybe um, meetings should be cut down in time because we don't have that commuting time or those gaps in between meetings to, to think things over. But I'm digressing a little bit here. So I think um, my main uh, challenge, I suppose, is being able to uh, share my knowledge and experience and support them without getting bogged down in the actual doing of the things. And uh, I have been on another board, um, another charity. So, and I did a course with Arts and Business Scotland years ago, introduction to being a board member. So that was really useful grounding. Um, and I think more people should be encouraged to join, join boards because it just, you know, it's good experience, isn't it? It's not about you and about what you're doing. It's about ensuring that a charity is accountable and doing its best uh, for its users. Um, yeah, so I guess as well around the whole um, governance piece as well, um, Siobhan sh shared some really interesting links there, which I'll definitely take back to the party, um, to the to the charity, and we will kind of work through those. And I'm sure that will help um, uh, help go forward with everything. We might need to source some volunteers as efficient. I'm big about knowledge transfer and enablement as well. So I would be interested in sparking discussion about uh, how do we get everyone to own a little bit and feed into this? Um, my day job, I work in, in PR and communications, and you can see very clearly in some channels that it's just a big corporate octopus with like loads of content about brands. It's like, meh, meh, meh. we don't live in a vacuum. We need to include all the different voices and all the different content. So that's another thing I'm interested in is exploring um, all the different stories. And um, on a side note, it's not necessarily related to what you're talking about right now, but um. I'm interested in learning more about digital experiences. So just like right now, we're having a, a virtual event, um, but how will that work? How can we augment that and enhance that experience for, for people um, with convictions and their families? So that's a big sh brain dump. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's what you were looking for, yeah. but thanks, Sarah. Thanks for, uh, thanks for the time. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, I, I delete all the points there. <laughs> I think... I think actually how do we connect trustees who not just need the board but actually being a digital trustee can sometimes be quite lonely because you're sometimes bringing about quite fundamental change in an organisation and try to do that without thinking about how do you connect with other trustees who've maybe got experience of doing that or going through the same issues as you I think is, is really important and there probably needs to be more work done to, to connect trustees and um, yeah. who are looking for the digital aspect. Yeah, and that loneliness is a, a difficult one. I mean, like one like kind of pretty absurd example of what being a digital trustee is not as I was once in a board with Jocelyn Burnell, the physicist, and that ended up helping her get a Wi-Fi connection or a BlackBerry so she could get emailed in India. And it's like, that is not part of the digital trustee brief, but you end up doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the worst things a board can do is say, oh, 
this trustee is doing it, so we'll all just forget about it and not think very hard about it. Um, that's problematic if you do that because you're then only relying on one person's judgment and also the rest of the board are sort of asleep at the switch and actually what you do as a board you do collectively so mm -hmm. you need to be you don't all need to be on top of every detail of everything but you need to know enough to know that this is a good judgment to make and it's really important not to isolate a digital trustee and say oh they're now going to solve everything for us because that's not the way it works yeah. Absolutely. Any any other questions from the room? So you can either pop it in chat or if you just, just want to unmute yourself, you can jump in and ask. Um, there's an interesting one about scale. So I think somebody said, mm -hmm. you know, does one. can you do you need to be less ambitious if you're small? And I, I probably gave that impression a wee bit, but actually I don't think that's true anymore. Like one charity I've been in touch with is called Feeling Strong, who are based in Dundee, and they're really small, very young charity. But because they went digital first from the beginning, they've just been able to, you know, make it all work as they went along. So they're actually, if you were to see the capability that they've got, you'd think, wow, this must be quite a big organization, but actually they're really small, just a few staff members. Um, and sometimes small organizations are less invested in either technology or particular processes. So if you decide you want to change something it can be easier to do it in a smaller organization than a, a bigger one. Yeah, that's a good point. And actually, I think I, I would say even quite big organizations probably only have the bandwidth to do one or two big changes at once. Mm. So, yeah. No, yeah. That's a good point. And, and, you know, one of the big shifts in technology over the past decade has been everything, almost everything moving to a service base, right? So it was in the past the case that only if you were a large organization could you use modern tools and technologies. And now there is so much that is either free or available on a pay-as-you-go basis that actually it doesn't make that much difference whether you're a large or small organization. And it may well be the case that in the small ones, you've got less bureaucracy. Not guaranteed, right? But some of the time. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I think, I mean, one of the, one of the big things I've run up against in the past is that, that initial commitment of cost and you know those big difficult questions about do we spend reserves and some of this stuff how do we get an external help to make this happen and that little bit of ability that if you're just not a charity you probably don't have the luxury of that but equally you're not tied into some giant bespoke system that you purchased two years ago that you now you know just isn't fit for purpose anymore. Uh, Sean Beaton do you want to jump in you had your hand up there earlier. Um, I suppose it's a sort of uh, sort of broadish question. Um, when you go, th I work for a disabled persons organisation, and we're setting up a disabled persons organisation in Highland called High Ability, and its ambition is to be a digital DPO, digital disabled persons organisation fit for the 21st century um, and COVID happened. So that was quite kind of happen chance. Um, one of the biggest barriers, and I won't bore you with the stats on digital exclusion, but one of the biggest barriers that disabled people have to using digital um, is 60% of them say the problem is confidence. So we got them confident on Zoom and then we needed teams because we want to start building an electronic office because we don't have to want to have the overhead of having an office. And then if we do go back to physical meetings, we'll do it around Highland and join other people in. But the off the shelf thing is, is useful, but also a bit of a barrier because although there's many products off the shelf that we could, you know, I look at this, the, the problem they ask me and then say, well, there's the digital solutions, pick one that works for you. The problem is the same buildings, people have confidence with the different solutions and it'd be really useful if people thought there was something that was a bit more integrated. Uh, I mean, I'm very lucky I've got Microsoft Teams coming in to give them a training um, through another relationship we have them as an organization, but the off the shelf stuff, you know, on one hand we'll be doing planning stuff on Miro and then you're gonna be having Zoom meetings and then you're gonna use an MS Teams to store your documents. And then is that GDPR compliant? And there's all these worries and tensions around it. And it would just be lovely if you could just go online, find something that had the conferencing secure, it had the, you know, the, the financial documents, the governance documents secure, 
um, was integrated with your social media so you can see the messages coming in from your Facebook. And I just don't know if anything out there exists. And I suppose my other thing I was going to mention was that when we were writing the digital volunteer description, uh, uh, digital trustee description, we discovered that we were asking them basically to change the world on their own. Um, and I find it very constructive to split out some of those capacities and asks into digital volunteer descriptions and doing those things concurrently helped us co-produce both things at the same time. So that was just a, an aside. What's John, John or Chris, do you want to pick up that? I guess that notion of like, you know, do you have a disparate network of off the shelf monthly cost tools or do you try and have something that encompasses lots of functionality in a single space? And, any thoughts on that? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I suppose focusing on like just a round tree for a second, you know, we've got SharePoint there, there's some stuff in there, but I think until we get to a point where trustees are easily and regularly signed into that, that can't be the exclusive place where everything is because it may be invisible to some trustees. Um, but I do think for a lot of the things that trustees would want to do in terms of reviewing documents, having meetings or discussions, you know, Office 365 probably does quite a few things. Yeah. Um, I think it will depend maybe a wee bit on um, if they're working. I mean, I think somebody in the chat talked about Basecamp and said that's a tool that their trustees are using and seems to be okay. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing is to kind of be in touch with how your trustees are getting on and like, if it's something that you can see they're active and everybody's involved, then I'd run with that. I wouldn't feel that it has to be, as long as it's meeting the standards you need in terms of security and so on. And um, as Chris said, go with where people are. And like, you know, the meeting front Zoom is where people are right now. That may change, of course. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think it can be um, like, particularly now when we're all spending a lot more time in front of screens, it's quite like it's quite exciting, right? Because there are so many tools available. And like you say, like we'll try Slack and we'll try Teams and we'll try Miro and we'll try Trello and we'll do this for that. Um, and I think, you know, where groups are up for that kind of experimentation, then I think it's um, good to do. Um, I would say two other things though. One is um, like figure out what, like what your minimum requirements are and make sure you solve that before you solve all the nice to haves. Um, and then the second thing I say is, and this is more of a kind of personal view, um, I would strongly encourage people to stick with um, one of the big SaaS products, right? Whether it's Office 365 or Google Workspace or, well, frankly, that's probably about it. Because the truth is, like, what do you want? Do you want a set of tools built by one of these tech companies that understands exactly what it's doing and patches them 500 times a day mm -hmm. or do you want to build your own thing that you've put together and maybe meets your needs today and then becomes a thing that you've got to maintain forever um yeah. and i think you know you've got to choose the former option because i think you're right i mean i think chris and, and thank you both for your, your practical comments because it does help for people to ground you when you start getting quite agitated about this stuff like, oh my god you're going everywhere but um, yeah, I think yeah, I think you're right because I mean, what we do want to do is if we do get people familiar, and that confidence is the biggest barrier for disabled people. Having something that's not going to fall very quickly into being obsolescence is is really really useful. Yeah, uh, and but, it's the same and it's the same sort of thing which either you know your staff and your trustees or your uh, you know the people that you support use in other parts of their lives, right? Don't make people learn a new thing if they don't have to. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. I, I there was a charity I was working with the other day, and like you know, they've been like literally for a year back and forward with their board about all these platforms. And, you know, they've now got this weird stitched together system where they've still got a server in the office. Some people have got, you know, three six five. Some of them have got like desk based, and then they're using Dropbox to kind of like this mashed up thing that sits in between. And Chris is right. There's two options really. There's like there's Microsoft's offering or there's Google's offering. There isn't really anything else as that standard infrastructure you're going to choose. And, and that's kind of liberating as you've got those two providers to choose from, both of which give free offerings to charities. Microsoft has different tiers in it. Google's is a free standardized platform. But once you've got that as your starting point, it kind of frees you up to be thinking a bit more cleverly about some of the service delivery stuff and the process-driven stuff. 
and you're not bogged down in constant discussions about just simple IT infrastructure, which at the end of the day is ultimately like the plumbing or the photocopying. Um, there was a question that came in, and I can't find it. In fact, it was, it was Raza Sadiq had asked it about. Oh, yeah, it was that about pace of change. I was interested in that because what yeah. I was going to ask Raza was you talked about somebody from the public sector having expectations about pace of change, and I wondered if it was slower or faster in the public sector because it could be either, right? Uh, can, you, can, you answer, yeah? can, can I? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Can I just add in? Sorry. Uh, yeah. I've come across uh, recently, we're a very small organization and we don't have staff. We run by volunteers, a lot of young volunteers we have. And yes. so there was a mismatch amongst trustees because they're coming from established organizations with the, the maybe thousands and thousands of staff and expertise and every aspect of it and expecting the similar pace for a change. And that become a barrier rather than a solution to moving forward. Because we were, on, we were not online organization at all at one stage, all physical activities on the pitch and these kind of activities. And we have to switch back to working from Zoom and which was a big change for us, but young people adopted very well, but only the trustee, they were not adopting well to this service. Okay, yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, that's a really interesting uh, question. Um, I think it's an interesting dilemma because at, at one level, um, you want trustees who know the territory with the organization and know like well what's realistic for us to ask for but also I think organizationally having trustees from different contexts is really helpful sometimes it brings other perspectives in it can help you challenge the status quo a bit more and um, but I think the big thing to avoid often for any board is if if you say your board members find a service difficult they shouldn't assume that's going to be true for your service users as well and I think a lot of medium-sized organizations I've been involved with often the board or people that have been involved with the organization for a long time, whether they've volunteered for a long time or whatever it might be. And they can be quite closed minded because they think, well, if this is true for us, it must be true for everybody that interacts with us. And that's not necessarily true. And um, so it's finding that balance. So get the outside perspective in, but also make sure that they're not asking for the moon on a stick by next Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, and I, I would I would say say the same thing about trying to recruit trustees in private sector is don't assume that that's going to solve all your problems. And so there's some amazing people coming from the private sector and the charities and changing the way that you're thinking and changing practices. But it's not a stick and plaster. It's like you don't just recruit someone who works for a random business and then all your problems are solved. And actually, a it's not favouring the trustee, but b it's kind of doing a disservice to people who work in the charity sector and who know your beneficiaries inside out and know what they're talking about. I don't know if you've you got any thoughts on that, Chris, in terms of recruiting public or private sector trustees and the kind of the benefits that brings and some of the challenges it brings as well. Um, so I think um, I think the point earlier about having diversity on the board is um, a really good one and all the different dimensions that you should think about that on. Um, I would say a couple more things. One is like, an, vary a lot by organization but certainly like in our world at Enable Scotland because we have a lot of contact with local authorities and with health service and, and other parts of you know other institutions it's very helpful to have people on the board with that sort of background or knowledge of how those organizations operate um, so it's that and that's more relevant to some places than others um, and then I think um, in terms of you know people with private sector experience um, like I'm very much in the camp that thinks that, um, you know, there are lots of things about the way that one runs a business that are very applicable to the way that you run a charity. Just, you know, you've got your social purpose and your mission is different, but the need to run a really tight ship um, remains. And it's important because that's the way that you um, maximize the resources and the time and energy you've got for the people that really matter, which is the people using the services that you provide right so i think if you bring people in on that basis and people are aligned to your mission but understand that you know nailing down some of the efficiency and organizational stuff helps you to achieve that then it's really powerful right? but everybody's going to have the same understanding on the way in um, and it's where like you know if you've got a clash of 
a vision or clash of principles, that's where you get the problems. And that's really about, you know, the recruitment process for your trustees um, and the dialogue the exec has with the board. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Alan, you had a question as well about recruiting new trustees and them feeling a, a disconnect to the organisation because they've been recruited during lockdown and they've been operating remotely, correct? Yeah, it's been interesting. We've recruited a couple of uh, trustees kind of through the late spring, so it was just it had to happen anyway at that time. So we went ahead and did it digitally. Um, Joseph Ryan Tree is unusual because trustees can serve for quite a long time. And so one thing we do anyway that we did pre-coronavirus is you have what's called a sitting in year, which is like a, an apprentice year. And in theory, you could get to the end of your year and decide, right, I don't want to do this and walk. Um, but what that means is it gives people a chance to feel they're in a year where they can really explore what it's like being a trustee. And they also get extra support. So they have a buddy that they're in touch with between meetings and that kind of thing. And there's more regular check-ins. And I think that's at the moment is a really helpful thing to be doing because it means that that relatively new person in an organization, you might often be thinking, well, I don't know if I can speak my mind here because I'm not sure what these people will think of it. If I, I say it, they can be a bit more confident and kind of welcomed in. Um, and I think one thing that I know that we've missed as a trustee body is if we do typically do a meeting, you get a chance for a cup of tea and a chat in between, if not a beer afterwards or whatever it might be. And that's, you know, you're not necessarily going to make um, lifelong friendships, but you do understand a lot more about people's background and um, what they're like as a person. So I think we haven't yet got an answer for that one. I suspect we may have to have some kind of Christmas chit chat over Zoom. But I think that one of the big problems at the moment is people have spent so much time in online meetings. It's like, it feels like a chore rather than a place you want to go necessarily. So if we said to trustees, oh, let's spend an hour or two having a chat, that might not work so well. But I think little bits of peer-to-peer -peer contact and picking up the phone can be really helpful to just get a feel for how somebody's doing. Yeah, absolutely. Alan, do you want to come in next? That was you, you were asking that question about being remote and purely remote for the three new trustees that you've got. Yes, thanks very much. This is really interesting um, and really enjoying this afternoon. Um, I just thought that, you know, the point I made is, is fairly self-explanatory really. And we've, we've coped by a growing use of an, an, uh, an essential use of, of Zoom and such like, but it's definitely something that we've been striving and probably struggling a bit is just to try and make that personal welcome of the new trustees into the organization and you know it, it it may seem i mean not that they were in the organ not that new trustees normally come into the facilities you know on a daily basis or anything but the ability to be able to do that and just see the staff or see the exhibitions or see the facilities has has been sorely missed i think really and we've just been all as existing trustees We've been very, very conscious of the need to to kind of we, we needed more people on our board. We needed to diversify our board, and and it's all it could almost feel like we've ticked those boxes, and therefore we'll just put those trust new trustees on the shelf again. So we've been doing a lot to try and you know um, and keep them engaged and involved, like you know our buddy system almost. Uh, you know, someday they can they can we have one to ones with them and such like just to talk through what we're doing. When I was really interested in what John said, mind you, they're just there about, um, particularly they're not, I haven't been interested in anything else he's said, but um, the the uh, the point about, um, you know, a, a year's a, apprenticeship almost sort of thing in, in a board is really interesting, but I'm just wondering to clarify, you know, we, we have a board that previously had three members and has now got six members. And a big concern for us is churn, um, you know, and, and, you know, needing people to come in and be involved from very early on. That I'm not sure how that, that necessarily could work for all organisations, but it's certainly something that's really, really interesting thought, you know, about that. I'm just wondering, though, mind you, I mean, presumably in that year, they're still signed up as a trustee legally oh, yeah. and such like, yeah? Yeah, so they're... Hmm, good question. Yeah, I think they go in the trustee, they're pretty sure... <laughs> Um, but yeah, so they participate fully and they're encouraged to as well. Like that's one thing we do stress is we want new trustees to feel, to almost be more vocal because they got such a fresh perspective 
And one thing we do towards the end of somebody's first year is say, give us five minutes and what you make of the trust so far, what you've seen, and what you think we're getting right, what we're not getting right. And that's often a very illuminating conversation we don't necessarily it doesn't necessarily become a big debate about us defending ourselves but we do tend to take those on board because often people spot things when they're new that longer serving board members have become a bit blind to and roughly how many trustees are on the, the uh, we're 12 so we're quite a big yeah. board so i think mm -hmm. that is a difference for sure is if you're in a situation where you're just trying to get enough people to get the work done then um, things like saying, oh, you can sit in for a year is maybe a bit of a luxury, but you could certainly do the practice of a couple of meetings in, get somebody to speak their mind. I think that's a useful thing to do. Awesome. Thanks, John. I've got a question for both of you. So I'm conscious that it's over there, a digital trustee, and are thinking a bit more strategically about digital, maybe looking to look at a digital trustee in the future. What what advice do you both have in terms of them taking stock at the moment in terms of where they go next? So that, you know, that big shift that people have made and launching them and using Zoom and other services online. And how can they take the time out to think a bit more strategically about where they're going to go next and what are those steps that they might want to take? Any thoughts? And whether that's coming from a board or senior management team. Hmm. Well, I think um, this question the world. Yeah, and, yeah, and like it's a good one. Um, and there's no easy answer. Um, I mean, so part of it is carving out the time to think about it properly, right? Because it can be quite easy to kind of just, you know, you get by day to day and um, you never step back. I think um, it's important that you do the exercise of listening to everybody, right? You're service users, your customers, your donors, your staff, your volunteers, your trustees, like the lots. Um, and I think it's important that you get some outside help for this. Doesn't mean you gotta, you know, write a gigantic check to a bunch of consultants every single time, right? But find somebody with an outside perspective, find, you know, two or three people who've done something interesting that you admire and get them to come and have a really, um, you know, frank conversation with you about it and there are resources that FCVO and other organizations can provide to help people with the sorts of questions to ask I'm sure and um, the kind of networks to explore um, but the main thing is like it's one of the ones that you can put off and put off and put off um, and then the world changes around us and you know you look how much has happened in the last nine months or in the last five years or you know matter, pick your horizon everything's changing so quickly yeah. um, so I think you gotta grip it yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I thought it was really good advice. Yeah, so you know, carving out the time to do this stuff and, and knowing when you need external support and what that external support looks like. I think that's particularly where charities have limited budget. That so I've worked with a charity recently where they kind of almost jumped immediately to the problem is people don't know about us, so we need marketing, and it's like marketing will solve everything. Yeah. And actually, you don't even understand the problem that you're trying to solve in the first place, never mind how you market the solution to the problem. And so trying to figure out the type of support you need sounds really obvious, but it's really critical. Sorry, John, I jumped over you there. No, it's okay. Um, I would, one thing I would maybe be reflecting on at this point is whether you're in a kind of consolidate phase or a, a bit stagnated phase. So I think a lot of organisations have tried a lot of new stuff in the last six months. So it's maybe time that you're thinking, let's take what's worked well and make it a bit more stable and a bit more um, fully mature and ready for longer term use. But other charities might have just felt very stuck in the blocks and they're stagnated, in which case maybe the kind of trustee you need is somebody who'll really give you a bit of a poke and move you along quite quickly. You might need that kind of a challenge. Um, the thing I'm going to shamelessly plug now is our digital checkup at digitalcheckup.org um, because what that's designed to do is to give you a holistic view of your digital capability. So it covers kind of four quite big categories. Um, so that could be an interesting thing to look at. What you can also do is get multiple people from the same organisation to do that. So if you complete it once and look at the end, there's a share link. So you can get different members of your board to do that together. 
and that could be quite an interesting conversation starter so you could get people reflecting on what feels like the priority areas to work on um, but as, as Chris said it's carving up that like that bit of time to think and take stock so that whether it's recruiting a new board member or getting some outside help that you're doing that on something that is really a priority area for you. And just to build on your point there about um, people have tried lots of different things over the last six months, which like I've seen that happening as well. And I think one of the, it connects back to the point earlier from Ross about different forms of experience on the board, right? So my sense is particularly in a commercial environment, you tend to have this impetus to try a bunch of things and then when they're not working, you stop them really fast because yeah. they're not working and you need to move on. And I think not always, but often in the charity sector, we get very attached to the things that we've built and the things that we've tried because of the nature of the work and, and the mindsets of the people involved. Um, but then you can sort of turn around one day and realize you've got all these different things happening and you've got to keep them all going. And then you've got to ask some hard questions about the value of all of them. Um, so being brave. Um, and also I think one way to protect yourself is when you start new things, like build in from the beginning, the checkpoints to understand whether it's working and if it's not working, a route to close it down rather than starting everything open-ended and then causing yourself trouble in three, six, nine, 12 months time. Yeah, I think that's good advice. And it's, it's particularly difficult as well when you've, you've liked the new and to stop those can be tricky. Try to stop any charity service can be tricky. Um, okay, we've still got a wee bit of time left. Any other Matt, you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, it's really about equipping um, the board trustees for the digital journey. Um, in terms of um, getting their engagement and also in terms of um, maybe evaluation as well. Um, I've, I've been a trustee and at the moment I'd hesitate from being a trustee again. I'm a volunteer for quite a few charities because I'd want to know about induction and I'd want to know about board culture. And that I could do that pre, you know, in the past, you'd maybe go along to a meeting and observe it or something. But how are these kind of questions answered now? These are the questions I would ask. John or Chris, do you want to take that one? Well, that means... Um, go on, John. Um, one kind of funny thing that we did in Joseph Andrew recently was because we wanted to recruit new trustees and wanted to try and widen our diversity, we went to quite a lot of effort to do video content and try and get content into places that we thought might reach um, a younger demographic. It didn't really work. Um, I'm not sure why. I'm sure we were doing something wrong at some point in the, the process. But um, yeah, so there's that. I guess the other thing is like, you know, digital now can give you tools. So um, if you had a a brand new trustee you could maybe even have a recording of a bit of a board meeting so they could see it could be an option and um, and yeah you can make information available a lot more easily you could also i think one of the big advantages i feel is that you can do quick trustee catch-ups um much more easily you know without the kind of conference call faff that we used to have to try and get different board members together you can share a link and off you go so I think that's helpful because I think my experience has been that's where trustees do the best work is when they're having those conversations and sharing their understanding so the more you can do that more easily then that's beneficial yeah. um, and I think the other funny thing about like written induction packs is you know we have one but it's often the kind of thing that really doesn't get updated very often so you might write something in 2008, which is like your policy in some area, and then change it, but forget to change the induction pack, which you only look at whenever you're trying to recruit a new trustee. So if something was linked, that would be a, a much better kind of resource for trustees. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I think one thing that you can do on, organisations can and should do on that front, and actually the same is true whether it's about bringing on board trustees or volunteers or hiring staff is like put more of this stuff on the internet right so like more and more organizations are writing about not just what they do but their values their culture the way they work the things they value in the people that work with them um 
that stuff is great for transparency. It will help people get a good idea of what the organization does and therefore be attracted to come and participate. Um, and if you put it on the internet, uh, it's quite hard to leave it for five years and not update it because you will yes. look very silly. Yes. Uh, we have Graham wants to jump in. Do you want to? Hi, uh, everyone. It's been a really interesting discussion. and Thanks for, for everything. I'm, I wear three very different hats, and this is going to sound a bit like three pictures, so I apologise for that. The first thing is I'm actually I'm not currently a trustee, but I'm looking to become a digital trustee. So it's been really interesting listening to all the, the things that you've been talking about. And I've got lots of really useful links off the, uh, <laughs> off the chat to go and read up a lot more about, about that. So, so that's interesting. And the second one, which I really sort of hesitate to say, is that in my commercial world, I do sort of board advisory stuff for a lot of this stuff as well. But the last point, and the one that I really wanted to get to, was uh, since COVID started, we've seen so many changes actually in the, in the workforce. One of the things you may or you may not have heard about is the Scottish Tech Army. Um, a lot of us who were furloughed, who ran out of contracts, who were made unemployed, have been volunteering as part of the Scottish Tech Army. But there's about 1,200 of us. And this is, you know, there are a huge number of developers. I'm a solution architect and product owner as a background, project managers, program owners, marketing, you name it. Just whenever anyone asks for anything, it's someone sticks their hand up. We've done about over 160 projects for charities so far. Now, some of the ones that we've been making noise about are really quite big, like COVID dashboards. Um, we're doing um, an ERP system to help uh, charities uh, manage their PPE stocks and things like that, one that I'm working on. But a lot of them are really small things like helping charities that don't have a digital presence get online, helping charities that need to make training videos to go out to their volunteers or the trustees, get them made. And it's done as a volunteering basis. So if you feel as a trustee or, or as a, a board member that this is something that you want to look at, go and have a look into the Scottish Tech Army because there's a window of opportunity where there's a bunch of us who aren't doing a lot of paid work and are crazily volunteering for everything under the sun that the third sector can make a huge use of because we're entirely focused on third sector and helping you guys get through COVID and beyond. Um, and just, you know, please come and use us. So, you know, we don't probably want to collapse under the strain, but actually that wouldn't be a bad place to get to. So, thanks. And I hope that helps John answer his question about philanthropy, because, uh, yeah, we've, there's a lot of investment that's coming into it. We're getting a lot of support from Microsoft, AWS, Google, all the big players, they're coming and giving us time, training, um, people, support, all sorts of stuff. Great. Thanks. Um, that's the Scottish Tech Army that um, Graham mentioned. You could probably put a link into the chat, I would guess. And yeah. that reminded me of another thing that I think trustees can do is have networks. So I think you have to do it a bit judiciously. So you have to definitely, if you're recommending something as a trustee, you need to be sure it is like, a good fit um, because you know your staff might say oh well our trustees said we should look at this so we better go and look at it whatever we think of it so but I think you know you may know often a really common one is maybe you're involved with other organizations too and if there's a trustee you think well that organization did this thing 12 months ago just putting them in contact can often help people learn from each other which is a very constructive way to to move forward John, I think you were going to come back and don't know, you get your hand up. John Beaton. John Beaton, yeah, sorry. Or did you accidentally have your hand up, John? You're on mute as well. I did actually have my, my hand up accidentally, but I think I've fallen digital love with Graham Nickel, so I shall be getting in contact with him. <laughs> <laughs> with with a million and one questions, but hopefully they'll be sensible ones. But yes, thank you very much, Graham, for reminding me of that. I, that yeah, this is great, and and thanks to everybody in the in the meeting. That their advice and support and what's on the chat is brilliant. It's great. Thank you. So on, yeah. just put a link in there as well to Digital for Good, so they're worth uh, looking at in terms of support for the third sector. 
So it's digitalforgood.uk if you want to have a, a look at that in terms of the work that they've been doing as well. Uh, okay, any, any final questions? Any advice, just final bits of advice from John and Chris? So if someone in the room is looking to recruit their first digital trustee, what's what's your one bit of advice for them in terms of, of making that step? Where should they start? Um, I think I would say I'd have a bit of a sense about what, what would you like to happen as a result of this trustee? I think you don't want to have an abstract. We just want a kind of sorcerer's apprentice to come in and make everything magic in three weeks. I think you need to be a bit more reflective than that. And I think also I would say, as a board, you need to commit to kind of supporting this process. So if you want to use a digital trustee to get to a different place, make sure you're ready to help that move happen rather than having this isolated digital trustee carrying the can. And that doesn't mean as a board, you all need to become absolute digital gurus overnight. That's not required, but you do need to be open-minded enough and ready to go with change. Because I think sometimes organizations, particularly around digital things, what they think is, we want to be a bit more digital, but not too much. So it's like, they'd like to be a slightly better version of themselves, but not have to make any difficult choices. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. I think as trustees, you need to be brave sometimes, as, as Chris said. So being ready to change a bit. Yeah, that's really good advice, actually. Yeah, really good advice. Yeah. Yeah, really good. I agree with all of that. Um, you know, do the, it doesn't have to be long or complicated, but like take a moment to do the analysis to figure out what caps you have on your board, like where you can be realistic about what belongs to the board, what belongs to the staff and what belongs to your volunteers. Um, and I think the last thing I would say is um, like, don't let all of this be too daunting you'd be surprised actually what you can pull off with a Facebook page and a Google form. Yes. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, actually where I've seen digital trustees do really well is trying to just even just change an attitude from boards that digital is a big, long, expensive procurement process. And that's, that's all digital is because that's been lots of boards relationships with digital is someone comes to the board, asks for lots of money, or someone on the board decides you've got to spend lots of money and it's just a big, long, laborious procurement process that a board gets bogged down into. And actually, just yeah, Chris's point there, that this stuff can be really nimble and cheap and it can provide efficiencies and it's not actually always asking about lots of money and big, long-term processes. So it's really good piece of advice. Um, just to echo as well the, the resources that Siobhan's been putting, there's some really good stuff in the SCBO site about governance and trustee recruitment um, and also REACH volunteering. I don't know if they still do it, but REACH for a while where... Uh, if you put a tr trustee vacancy up, you could also advertise on LinkedIn for that trustee vacancy as well. And where that's quite powerful is that ability to break out with those traditional third sector networks. So, you know, as John said, you know, if I'm trying to recruit an accountant, why am I putting that on a place that only charity sector people read when I actually need to get it in front of accountants? So if I want a really specific data analyst, analyst to come join the board, how do we get that people that have got that experience and that that ability to advertise on LinkedIn for free can can open up those new avenues that you've not thought about? And um, that's probably one of my actually big bits of advice is trying to look beyond your existing board network. There's a good chance the person you want isn't in your board network, and nobody in your board network has the right person, and that's okay. And for a lot of boards, recruitment just happens in that close network of the board and the the uh, and the chief exec. And, and that's kind of not good enough, never mind just in terms of digital, but in terms of diversity in your board, it's not good enough to be doing that in 2020. So you really need to push those boundaries a bit more and, and think a bit harder about that. Okay, uh, Siobhan or Maddie, any final thoughts from you? No, no Maddie's just packing up her entire life there behind us. <laughs> yeah. I was convinced that was like a raft that you'd built on the right hand side, but I don't, don't know what. It's a coronavirus life raft for she did the worst come to the worst. I think the only thing for me is something actually, Ross, that you said at the matching, it was a was it last year you did the big lottery matching kind of speed dating for trustees and people yeah. was you were talking about if you are thinking about joining a board, if you're not a trustee already, is to think about the journey that the organization is at and where do you want to be. So I think both John and Chris have kind of touched on that because that was something that I really had to consider was actually, do I want to be right at the start 
or somewhere else along that organization's journey about where they're at, where they're going for, because it is my free time. So I have to be passionate about it. This, it my day job is digital. So if I'm doing it in my free time, the topic I have to be passionate about, and then also that thing around how much do I want to give? And the other point, Ross, that you do always make is that make sure you are not there to be the social media expert. And that's back to Chris's point about what's the definition of digital, because as digital trustees, we can end up being the social media person. And as Ross always says, that's a person's job. People go to university to study that stuff. So pay somebody to do it. Don't be that trustee. That's mine. So those are not my wise words, Ross. They're yours. I've just repeated I just can't them remember. That's on good. your behalf. <laughs> Uh, I was going to say that's really good advice, but then that's just me saying that my advice is really good. Uh, so I don't know if that's appropriate or not. Um, yeah, and I think for those of you in the room who are recruiting trustees, is being really honest with the people you're recruiting. Like, you know, like we've just lost a massive amount of funding. We don't have any money. We're hoping digital might solve this. Or we've got loads of money in reserves. I actually spoke to a charity today who have saved like a colossal amount of money. And it's travel expenses. Travel expenses are the single biggest expense that charity has on a monthly basis. And now they don't spend a single penny on travel. And they're like, we've got this money we didn't have before. And so they're they're able to invest in digital and hopefully it's going to play dividends further down the line. But you need to be really honest with the people that you're working with, like where you're at financially and where you're at in terms of the willingness to change that John mentioned. And um, I think unless you're really frank about that stuff, you, you can't expect someone to come in and make the change that, that you're expecting from them. Uh, John, any final SCVO type points or resources you want to pick up on? Um, not really. I mean, we've just closed our senior leaders program. So um, if that was still available, I'd probably be plugging that a bit. And I think but what that reminds me of is um, this kind of ambition and openness to change needs to go kind of right through an organization. So you do want you don't want to get to a kind of a static equilibrium, but you do want to get a bit, a bit of balance. You don't want like really pushy trustees and a staff team who are just saying, let's just keep it the same forever and ever. You need to have a bit of partnership going on. So that's important too, because you don't yeah. want to just set up a kind of tug of war over where the organization should be going. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's really good yeah. advice. Okay, right, we're gonna we're gonna finish up there. Um the the next one, I don't know, I don't know if people know about the next one. I don't even know if it's on the events page. Siobhan, is the next one on the events page? It's not, right. Okay. The day I have in the diary, because I'm looking at the diary in front of you all, and then like someone from my CV can tell me this thing doesn't even we start going no. on my head. I'll just do it anyway. Right. So 11 a.m. on the 15th of December is the date that I have. I remember John, we spoke about people wearing Christmas jumpers. I realized I've never owned a Christmas jumper because I'm from Fife and that's a frivolous spend. So I don't know. I we could send you a Christmas transfer and stick on. Yeah. Um, I think the thought we had was, like I said, you know, organizations have come so far in the last six months that it may be a bit of a reflective time. So what we may well do is contact people in advance to give them a bit of a, bring a thing that has worked really well. And we'll have a little look at that together because you know, something that really struck me forcefully over the summer was that the amount of ground that organizations were covering in terms of change was phenomenal. So, and I know that people probably have individually had a chance to, to reflect, but I think collectively as a sector, it'd be an interesting thing to, to look at across the board. Yeah, yeah, that'd be really good. Right, we'll, we'll get that live. Now I told you all it exists, then we'll, we'll try and get that one on, on the SCVO events page. Okay, right. huge, huge thanks for speakers. So John Fitzgerald from SCVO and also uh, Chris Yu, from Institute for Global Change. You can go and follow Chris as well on uh, Twitter, so it's CLRY2. It's not the catchiest Twitter username ever, but that's okay, that's fine. Uh, John's is, is it just John Fitzgerald? John Fitzgerald. John Fitzgerald, that's what I'm saying. So we'll go and follow him. Chris, do you still keep your AI blog up to date? Because I sent someone it the other day because they were trying to get examples of AI. Is it still kept up to it's, date? It's still there. It's um. I will be honest, I've, it's been a few months since I've done an update, but it's in the backlog of things to get done at some point. But there's like 800 and something things on there, so there's plenty to be going on with. Yeah, I think we shared the link in one of the other digits, yes, but there's some amazing stuff on there. You'll follow the link to Chrissy's Twitter, I'm sure. And uh, the link is in the chat now as well. Right, thank you very much for all joining us. Amazing. Have a nice weekend. It's